Good morning, Father's Faithful Sunday School class. I want to thank you for your faithfulness this week. I sent out a text to all of you letting you know that one of our church members needed prayer. And you immediately texted me back and told me that you were praying for him and for her. There was another one that also needed prayer this week. And I appreciate your prayers for them and for my family. I know I'm praying for your family and that is so important. And I'll continue to pray until we are together again. I want to talk to you for a few minutes this morning about something that David talked to me about a few weeks ago. He had been mowing and we have about six and a half acres and so he was had been on the mower quite a while. And he came in and he said, you know, when I was mowing today, I was thinking about what if I wasn't here tomorrow? You know, what would I be doing today? Maybe he was thinking that he wouldn't be on the lawnmower. I'm not sure. But when he said that, we talked a little bit about that song that Tim McGraw sang, Live Like You Were Dying. And I mentioned that I thought it was a little bit cliche. But then as I thought about it, I thought the reason I thought that was because I haven't been in that situation. I haven't been on my deathbed. I haven't been sick and dying. So I haven't had to think how differently I might live my life today if I died tomorrow. Most of you know that I exercise every morning since I've retired especially and I have an elliptical in the basement and I do about 30 minutes on the elliptical. Now that would be a hard thing for me to do if I didn't have something else to keep my interest. And so I've had Ben find television series and things that I can watch while I'm doing the elliptical. And the latest is a show called Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. You might remember it from the early 1990s. But one of the episodes this week when I was on the um, elliptical was called The End of the World. And again, I thought about what David and I had talked about earlier. What if you only had one or two days left to live? You know, how different would your life be? How different would you live your life? In this particular episode, there was a killer comet that the editor of the newspaper had told the town about. She had read an article in the New York Post, which was supposed to be very reliable to the townspeople and told them that on the 12th of the month at midnight, this killer comet was supposed to collide with the earth and every living thing on earth would be destroyed. Well, Dr. Quinn kept trying to tell the people that they were being gullible and that really wasn't going to happen, but the people started to believe. And I thought it was really interesting at first when they believed what the editor of the newspaper had told them, they wanted to party. You know, kids didn't go to school and they'd been saving fireworks for the 4th of July and they said, well, we don't need to save those anymore. We might as well shoot those off now. Uh, the blacksmith, who was the hardest worker in the town, decided that he would just lay in a hammock all day long and not do any work. His wife, who owned a little cafe, went out and bought the finest china she could find. She'd always wanted that fine china for her cafe, and she decided that she would just go ahead and buy it. The shopkeeper um, was just selling everything to everybody at the highest price he could. He was trying to make a profit. Everybody was just partying and having a good old time until the 12th day of the month came. And as they awaited that strike of midnight, their attitudes changed. In fact, I wrote down some of the things that they said. Um, the lady who bought the fancy china said, you know, I thought that fancy china would make my cafe something special, but it ain't the dishes, it's the people. And the man, the blacksmith, who laid in the hammock all day long said, you know, I thought I'd feel better if I laid around and rested. He said, but I never felt better than after an honest day's work. 
The shopkeeper said, I wanted to be the richest man in town, but if I could just have it tomorrow, I'd give you all your money back. And the editor said this, I hope someone finds my story. She had written a story about the town. Not because I want people to know what we did, but I want people to know who we were. I'd like to read the scripture today. It comes from the book of Luke, chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. As I think about this parable, I thought about the conversation that the man had not with a spouse or a friend or a parent or a neighbor, but he had a conversation with himself. I think that was probably a mistake because he surely could have gained more wisdom by talking with somebody else. Because he says to himself, I will do this. I will put down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax. Eat. Drink. Be merry. Do you see what I mean? He says, I. I. He's looking inward, only at himself, and that's why he's a fool. You know, he has this notion that life, especially the good life, consists of just possessions, and that's exactly what Jesus warns us about. So what does the good life consist of? It consists of relationships, right? You know, not once did Jesus bring up a retirement account or getting a higher paying job as part of seeking the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean those things are bad, and it doesn't mean that the farmer in the parable is bad either. He's not a bad man. Money can do a lot of wonderful things. Uh, it can help us provide for our families. It can help us meet the needs of others. It can help us uh, further the ministry at our churches. The problem in this parable is not the money, it's the man's attitude toward the money. You know, I think about the last few weeks and I think about the message that the world is shouting in our ears. Be afraid. You're not going to be able to get enough food. You're not going to have everything you want. Things are not going to be available to you. And that is exactly the message that the world is trying to convince us of. While Jesus is saying, Love is important. Relationships with family is important. Surely you've had more time to read your Bible and to study the Word and to grow closer to God in these times when you've had to stay at home and not do all the things that you're used to doing. You know, I think in a way that it's helped keep my life in balance. It's made me thankful for the good things in my life and to know that it's not that I need more because all I need God will provide. You know the farmer was blessed with good crops. He never saw the source of his blessings though. He neglected to notice the ones who were buying his crops, the ones who helped work the fields, and he especially forgot to thank the Creator, the one who made the soil and the seed 
and watered the seeds. Yes, the farmer was blessed with riches, but he never realized the poverty of his soul. Scripture also asks us to sort out what's important in our lives. You know, what deserves our time and our energy? As one philosopher puts it, life is not addition. It's actually more like multiplication. For if you multiply 100 expensive things times the zero inside you, you'll still end up with a zero. You know, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. So we need to be rich toward God with our time and our energy, and our love needs to go outwards. It's not all about me. We need to develop our relationships with other people. We need to strengthen our prayer life and our connection to God. And I hope that's what you spent the last few weeks doing. I'd like to read my column to you now. It is called Chasing After the Wind is Pointless. My list was long and I dreaded it, but the grocery shopping had to be done. I had several special events to cook for that week, and between school and church, I was going to be pretty busy. So I talked my husband into stopping by the store on the way home from Greensboro on a blustery Saturday afternoon. It was not my usual shopping place, but I was pretty sure that I could find the things on my list. I had a headache and was feeling a little grumpy. It didn't help to think about the skyrocketing price of groceries. Every time I go into a store, it seems that everything I buy comes with a bigger price tag than the time before. But as we pulled into the parking space, I had a comforting thought. My coupons. Recently, at the urging of my sister and a friend at school, I had started clipping coupons again. For years, I had decided that the cents off weren't really worth the time it took to pour over the paper, find the ones I needed, and cut them out. But remembering the $2 coupon that I had for cat food took away a little of the dread. Just a minute, I said to my husband as we parked. I almost forgot. I have a lot of coupons that expire this week, and I need to use them. He waited patiently as I dug the delicate slips of paper out of my purse, carefully checking dates and picking out the ones that I would use that day. I was amazed at the savings that I would accumulate just by buying the items on my list. I had several dollars in coupons by the time I finally got them all selected and organized. Maybe this shopping trip wouldn't be so bad after all. I'm ready, I said finally. I noticed that I had to push on the car door a little harder than usual when I was getting out. My goodness, I said to my husband as I ducked my head to shove myself from the cold. It's freezing, I said to him. The wind was so strong that I had to catch my breath before I spoke again. If I don't put these coupons in my pocket, I'm going to... My voice trailed off. Lose them, I finished. No sooner had the words left my mouth, my coupons left my hands. I had tried to stuff my list and my coupons into my pocket, but somehow the wind grabbed them first. Suddenly I heard a sound, something between a moan and a squill, and realized that it was coming from me. Then another sound. No, not my husband's voice, but an unfamiliar man's voice behind me in the parking lot. I'm so sorry, the voice said. So sorry. My husband didn't say a word. He had already sprung into action, chasing the little slips of paper all over the parking lot, reaching down to scoop a precious slip, only to see it fly off before he could grab it. In the end, he had stomped my list with his foot, managing to retrieve it. Between the two of us and our frantic efforts, we held up four coupons. The rest were gone with the wind. I was still shaking my head in disbelief as I entered the store. I was thankful that the long list had not been swept away forever, but I found myself in the exact same predicament that I had faced when we pulled into the parking lot at the store. What I had poured over, spent precious time and energy doing, was all for, how do they say it? Naught. Nada. Zilch. Nothing. The things of great value to me were gone. The next time the little slips of paper were seen, if they were ever seen again, they would mean nothing. They would be crumpled or wet or torn. They would be out of date. 
expired. They wouldn't be worth the paper they were printed on. What had been so valuable just minutes before had been snatched away in an instant. I thought about Solomon's words in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes when he said, My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1, 10, and 11. Still, for many minutes, instead of coupons, I kept visualizing dollar bills, my dollar bills, swirling wildly in that parking lot on that windy Saturday afternoon. I am thankful that this is not the end of Solomon's story, nor is it the end of mine. In the end, as I checked the last item on my list, I realized that in spite of what I had considered to be a great loss, I would not go hungry that day. My needs and even my wants had been met. I even had enough money left for the next shopping trip. And just like Solomon, I caught another glimpse of what is truly lasting, truly valuable, and truly worthy in this world. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, Solomon shares the lessons he had learned through all the experiences of his life, many similar to my own experiences. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. I pray that the next time I am tempted to chase after the wind, the Lord will remind me of what is important in this life. But then, if I really pay attention, he always does. Will you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you remind us every day of what is important. Lord, and we know that if this was the very last day that we would live, Father, the most important thing is the relationship that we have with you and the relationship with those that we love. Father, we pray that you will help us to love you more, to serve you more, Father, and to be the people that you've called us to be. Lord, we are thankful for our blessings. Lord, help us not to be greedy like the farmer in the parable, but Lord, just help us to love you and to honor you with our words and with our actions and in everything we do and say. Father, for those who have been on our prayer list this week, Father, we just pray that you would just lay your healing hand on those who have suffered and been sick this week. Lord, I pray that you would be with those who are afraid, those who are worried. Father, those who just need that extra hug from you this week and that extra comfort. Lord, I pray that you would be their comfort and their strength. Father, we thank you for every blessing and we pray that you would forgive us for our sins and help us to live every day just like you want us to live. For it's in your precious holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening again this week. I hope you have a wonderful week and I will see you soon.